uh, the title of my lesson today, my message is, The Laborers Are Few. And it's important for us to understand that every Christian has a calling upon their life. Every Christian has a ministry that they are to be working towards. And it's important that we're sensitive and in touch with God and allowing Him to lead and guide us. Uh, because a lot of times we get saved and we come to church and we're faithful, and that's definitely a part of it, but we have a ministry, we have a calling. And so we're going to look at today and see what that ministry is, what that calling is, and what our responsibility is as Christians. So we'll start in the Scriptures today in Matthew chapter 9 and the 36th verse. And it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the labors are full, are few. Pray you therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And we need workers to carry out the mission that God has left us. And we have to pray for the work of the Lord. Uh, and and, uh, and we'll, I'll get into some scriptures later that demonstrate this, but we, we have a responsibility that we pray for the message of the gospel to be, out, to be pushed out and to reach out to all corners of the world. And we know, you know we support several missionary efforts here, but there's missionary efforts all over the world that are taking this gospel to different parts of the world. Um, you know, if you've followed anything and you've seen what's going on in Afghanistan right now, uh, they are definitely under some tribulation and some trials that are going on right there. And there are still men and women there that are trying to take the message of the gospel forward. And so it's important that we are praying for God's will, not only in our lives, but in the will of the world, and that the message of the cross goes forward. And along with prayer, it's important that we are praying for guidance. And that we understand that we, we don't just pick something we like and, and jump into it. We have to pray for guidance and say, God, what, what is the mission that you have for me? What is the ministry that you have forth for me? And in Matthew chapter 28, uh, he is giving his disciples commands here in the 18th verse. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in the earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so, again, we reiterate, it is every believer's responsibility to take the message of the cross to the world, to take this gospel to those who are not saved. And some are called personally to go. You know, when we're talking about missionaries, we're talking about evangelists, some are called that that is their ministry is to go. Others are to send. And that sometimes talks about, uh, again, that's prayer, that's finances, that's sending and making sure that the missionaries, the evangelists, those people that are taking this message across the world, that they have the things that they need to be able to propagate the gospel. And so, and it's important that um, you understand where your money's going and make sure that it's going towards the will of God. You know, there's a, a ton of, of great organizations out there and they do a lot of great things, but if you are giving an offering to someone, you need to make sure that what they are taking, one, that they're taking the gospel, and that two, that they are doing the work of the Lord. And again, that comes with prayer, that comes with, with investigating and seeing, okay, if I'm supporting uh, this organization, are they, taking the, the, are they taking those funds and using them for what needs to be used for? Uh, you know, too often we see in ministries that there's a lot of excess spent on things. There's a lot of things that are spent that it's, it's not doing anything to take the gospel forward. It's, it's either uh, allowing a, a minister to, to live a life of luxury, or it's allowing for there to be things that spin on that just that, that do not move the gospel forward. Um, so again, seeking for guidance, praying for the leading of God and the work of the ministry. 
And then uh, uh, another thing is, is what are the fruits of that ministry? What are the fruits of that that ministry is going out and doing? Um, you know, here at Christonville, we've worked to make sure people understand, hey, you're giving us money for this. Here's where that money's going towards. Um, you know, just recently, um, uh, the church has sent some Bibles to Pakistan and had them translated uh, into Urdu, where they have the, the uh, portable Bibles where they can hear it because a lot of the people can't read. Again, that's a fruit of you're giving us this money, we're taking it, and we're pushing it to make sure that the gospel is being propagated. So we have to understand to make sure that our efforts are going to what God has. And in the 19th verse here, he's, uh, the word is used as teach. It says, go therefore and teach all nations. And right there is the preaching of the truth. It's talking about um, preaching to the lost. So he's talk, it uses the term teaching, but in that sense, it's talking about preaching to the lost. And then in the 20th verse, it says it's teach, and the word there means to instruct. And, and the meaning there is after salvation. So we have before salvation, we have to take this message of the gospel to the word, and we have to preach and teach them about what the gospel is. After salvation, after we've been saved, it's important that we teach, that we instruct about the gospel. And that's one of the things when you're looking at a, a ministry is, do they have a Bible study? Are they teaching you the word, right? Um, it, it's great on Sunday morning, you know, to come and you hear a man, a good message and man, it gets you fired up and you're ready for the week. But what is the, what are the study habits that are going into that? And e even in our own personal walks, the more that we study, the more that we invest in the word, the more open we are to hear from God. Um, the more that we are in His Word, the more He's able to, to open things up to us. And, and I know we've all done that, but how many of you guys, you've been reading something, and maybe it's a scripture you've read hundreds of times, but all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just pulls something out and just reveals something to you that you've never seen before. Again, that's being, that's being uh, mindful of the Spirit of God. That's being, taking time and being in His presence. And, and so many times we get so caught up with the cares of this world that we forget to stop and find that quiet place and spend some time with God. And when we're talking about what God has for you and what your calling is, those are the times when God will begin to speak to your heart. As I was preparing for this message, there was two things that just jumped off the page. Uh, and, and I just, I said, man, I never saw that. I've never seen that. But if you don't dive into the Word, if you don't study the Word and have an understanding of it, you won't get those revelations. So it's very important. So we understand that we have a work to do. The next thing that we have to understand is the timing. The timing is now. You know, too often in, in a Christian walk, we, we take that phrase, wait on the Lord, and we take it a, a little too far. And sometimes we, we say and we just go, I'm waiting on God. And we just kind of sit back. And that's not what God has called us to do. We need to be seeking the Lord. We need to be seeking and saying, God, what do you have? And then once he begins to open and reveal himself and lay that in, in your heart, you have to start taking steps towards that. Now, again, everything in, in temperance, everything in moderation. You know, if, if you're here and, and, and in the service and, man, you feel like God says, Drop everything, and I want you to go to the Middle East, and I want you to be an evangelist. I want you to be a missionary over in, in Afghanistan and, and in these places. There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, God, let me, let, me, let me pray, let me seek you, and make sure that that's your word. Make sure that's your will. So that doesn't mean just the first time we have a thought pop into our mind, we take off running with it, right? Because you can miss God there, too. But we have to make sure that we are seeking Him, and then once He lays that on our heart, we have, to, we have to actively seek and say, okay, God, how do I get there? What's the next step? And as we begin to step and we begin to walk by faith, doors will open and things will, will be taken care of. And so we have to understand that the time is now. And in John chapter 4, in the 34th verse, um, Jesus has been ministering, and he's been ministering for a while, and he hasn't eaten. And his disciples come to him, and they're encouraging him. They're saying, Master, you know, stop and eat something. You haven't ate. You're going to get weak. And he says in the 34th, 34th verse, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. 
And you know, he came, his mission was to die on the cross. And that was his last words when he hung on the cross. He said, it is finished. And we have to understand there's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of urgency. As you look and you see all the nonsense that's going on in the world, there has to be a sense of urgency to go to the lost. And, and again, it's up to someone, it's up to them to accept it. We just simply have to, to, have to put out the word. Here's what the word says. But as we show ourselves, as we show that love and that compassion, and as we witness to other people, that's our job. We can't help it if they don't accept it and they don't take it. We just keep offering. and We just keep putting forth and saying, here's what, here's what God says. God loves you. God cares for you. You've got problems. You've got trials. You've got things going on. Come and try God. Give God a chance and see how God will work. But if we don't push forward and we don't take this message, we're failing millions and millions of people. So he hadn't eaten, and he, but his duty was not to allow his hunger, his natural hunger, to get in the way of what he was supposed to be doing. And we have to actively, actively seek. And then here's the thing. Again, once we know, you know, knowing and doing is two different things, right? I can know that I'm, I'm supposed to get up on time and get dressed and go to work. But if I'm doing that, that's two completely different things. So we, a lot of times we know what God's will is, and we'll kind of feel a tug that way, but we're not taking steps and actions to make sure those things are happening. And so it's very, very important. Again, we have to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. And the more that you pray, the more that you read, the more that you encompass yourself with the gospel and, and that relationship with Christ, the more you know. And you think about that in our, in our everyday relationships. There's those people that you know, and you know them well enough, you can tell when something's off. And nobody else may know, but you can tell something's not right with them. Well, why do we know that? We know that because we have a relationship with them. And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. The more we build that relationship, the more we allow the Holy Spirit to work and move in our lives, the more we're sensitive to, to where He's pushing and pulling us to. I know uh, when I was a little kid in church, and uh, I, I swear, we you know, grew up in a Pentecostal church, and so you know the music is loud and everything's going on, but above everything else, I remember being a little kid, and if I was cutting up, I could hear my mother breathe over everybody in the church. And he'd just hear that, and he'd go over it. And I, I would freeze. I'd be on one side of the church, she'd be on a, the other, and I'd look over there, and she'd, ha you know, she'd have that mama face. She'd cut her eyes at me. Uh, and every now and then, my dad, uh, he, he played the organ and led the worship service, but every now and then, he'd catch my eye. And then I knew I was really in trouble if he was catching me cutting up in the thing. But why? Because I had a relationship with them, and I understood and we have to understand that with God, we have to have that relationship. And he says in the 35th verse, he says, Do you not say it's still four months until the harvest comes? Look, I say to you, raise your eyes and look at the fields and see they are white for harvest. And again, our task at hand is to see souls saved. And you don't have to look very far to understand and see the need People are crying out. People are hurting. People are scared. People have any kind of problem you can imagine. They have it. And they are looking for answers. And, and church, it is our job to say this is the answer. Again, if, if people don't listen, if they don't follow, if they don't come, that, that's on them. But it is our job to take the message of the cross to the world. And you think of it this way. Someone brought this message to you. The reason that you're here today is because someone brought this message to you. Whether that's because you grew up in a home where they took you to church and you heard that message, or because someone invited you and said, hey, come listen to this. Someone brought this message to you. And it is our duty that we have to now turn and take this message to other people. We have to be disciples because he said, go into all the world and bring this message. And we bring that message by, by our actions. We bring that, that message by our words. But we have to understand that God has given us a challenge, and that challenge is to take this message to the world. And he, said, he says in the 36th verse, he says, Already the reaper is receiving his wages, and he is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that he who plants and he who reaps may rejoice together. 
For in this case, the saying is true, one person sows and another reaps. In the 38th, he says, I sent you to reap a crop for which you have not worked. Others have worked, and you have been privileged to reap the results of their work. I, as I read those scriptures, what came to, to my mind there is for someone to get in the church and to hear that message, think, I, I want you to think about all the people that have to line up. A, a pastor was talking this morning, and he was talking about how God's in the background and he's pulling the strings. But I want you to think, for someone to come in this church or someone to turn online today, most likely they received an invitation. So someone witnessed to them and said, come to the church. And then when they decided and came into the church, someone had to greet them and, and make them feel welcome. And then when they got in here and the church started, the worship team has to be sensitive to what God has said. And, and it's funny, so many times, because um, I, have, I, you know, I, n- I never have a clue what they're going to sing, and, and for my knowledge, they don't have a clue what I'm going to preach. But it's funny how God will line that up. That's, that's, that's intentional. God lines that up to what, what the message is with the music. And that's why if, if they're not sensitive to God's leading and guiding, they may miss something. But now the music comes forward, and then the message comes forward, and the person giving that message has to be, has, has to be listening to God and has to have a word from God. All those things lined up, and that's what he's talking about here in John, that one is planted and one has reaped and another has sowed. And if we understand that we have a link in the chain, and, I, and I'll get off message here for just a little bit. If you're here this morning or if you're listening through our webcast, understand there has been things in place. God has set things in place for you to be here this morning and you to hear this gospel. And it is up to you to make the decision that you are going to follow this way or not. But God has put things in place, and that's how much he cares about each individual person for them to have a chance to hear this message, to hear this good gospel news. And again, we have to take that out because people will talk all the time about Christians, about, man, there's just something different about them. There's just something that they have on the inside. There's a peace and a joy that we have. And it's our job to tell people, well, let me tell you what it is. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that's down in my soul, and that is is the difference. Amen. Amen. And it's, you know, it takes the work of many people, and we have to understand it takes all of us doing what God has called us to do. It takes all of us to make sure that the gospel is being carried out. So when you go out of here and you, your soul has been fed, it's now your job to turn and take and take this message to the people that you interact with. And Sometimes it's witnessing. Sometimes it's just how you live your life. Sometimes it's when someone cuts you off in traffic and you have a choice to yell and scream and beep the horn or give them, just give them a wave, right? So in our actions, in how we treat people, in how we deal with people, we are taking the message of the cross. We also have, within taking the message, we also have a, a responsibility to pray for the work of God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and 1, this is uh, Paul. He says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Prayer propagates the gospel. Prayer moves the gospel forward. In Daniel, uh, when, when Gabriel comes to Daniel and he's giving him his vision, he's, giving him, uh, he's telling him about the end times, he talks about in there that he was held up because of principalities, because of dark forces. And we have to understand this is an evil, evil world. And as this message goes forth, just like we're supposed to you know, send funds and make sure that our evangelists and our missionaries have what they need, we also have to be in prayer for them. We also have to be in prayer that those obstacles and those roadblocks would be taken down and doors would open for the message of the cross to go forward. And you look at um, last year when, when the... Uh, radio opened up, and we had our, our radio drive to take the message through radio. I believe that, I, I 100% believe that was God. God opened that door, and, and I believe it was, I don't remember what the total number, but it was over 3 million people that came in and listened to our radio broadcast. 3 million people heard the Word of God, and had, had Pastor not listened to what God is saying, that's 3 million people that would missed out on hearing the Word of God. 
And it's so important, saints, that we understand what is your calling? What has God brought you to do? And the, the, the third point of my lesson is God has called us to work. God has called us with a ministry. God has called us to do something. And a lot of times we think of, when we hear a call on someone's life, we think of a pastor, an evangelist, we think of music ministry, we think of teachers and, you know, all of these things, but all of us have a calling on our life. And Jesus gives this example in Matthew chapter 25, and for time's sake, we won't go through all of the parable, but I want to hit the highlights. Uh, in, in chapter 25 and verse 15, uh, Jesus is talking here. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several abilities, and straightway took his journey. So to every servant he gave a, a, a certain talent. All right, And that's money. He gave them a certain amount of money. And God will equip us, God has equipped us with what we need to carry out the work that He has for us. And again, the more in tune that you are with God, the more consecrated you are to God, the more that God will give you, the more responsibility that He'll give you, the more that He'll give you to step out and do. So a lot of times <clears throat> people say, Man, I'd love to be a preacher, I'd love to be a pastor, I want to go do this. But have you consecrated to God? Have you, have you made that connection and have you prayed and sought God? Because, uh, you know, people don't understand when you are in those roles, there is a lot of pressure. There is a lot of things that comes up and you have to be in touch with God. And so we are called to be faithful to what God has called us to do and to stay in the lane of what is God has called us to do. If God has called you to be an evangelist, don't try to be a prophet. If, if God has called you, if he's called you in a certain ministry, make sure that you stay in that ministry. And a lot of times we want to take what we like to do and we want to slap Jesus on the front of it, right? And, and we have to make sure that we're seeking God for what he has for us, for what work that he has for us. And in our everyday walk, there's things that we can do, but we must be seeking God. God, what do you have for me? And that's scary a little bit sometimes. That's scary because we, we, we don't all, sometimes God asks us to do stuff we don't want to do. I'll give you a prime example. It is not my desire to be up here preaching. I love talking to people. I love being in front of audiences. It doesn't bother me at all. But to, to get up and, and to speak the word of God, that's not what I had planned for my life. But nonetheless, it's what God has called me to do. So I have a responsibility to make sure I follow through with that and I do that. And so sometimes we're scared to kind of seek the will of God. But I'll tell you this, when you get in line with the will of God, there is a blessing and there is a joy and there is a peace that comes with that. And when you just continue to step and walk in, in faith. And there's times where you go, man, I, I'm walking, but I, I, don't, I don't really know. Keep walking, keep praying, keep seeking, keep getting that deeper relationship with God, and He'll open those doors and He'll illuminate the path and say, here's where you're going. Here's what's happening. And you know, sometimes He just gives us just a little bit of, of the path because that's all we can handle. But you keep walking on that path, and then as He opens more and more, and then you look back and you see where God has led you. Uh, I never would have thought in a million years that I would be living in Texas and, 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 and preaching. That's not what, again, that's not what I had planned for my life. I wanted to be a basketball coach. That's what I enjoy. And I did that for a while, but I finally said, okay, God, I'm going to submit to you. What do you have? And God starts opening doors and things start happening. And I'm so satisfied and I'm so happy with the life that I have right now. And I see where God continues to lead. And so when we yield that, you know, we have a self-will, but when we yield that and we say, God, what do you have for me? That's when we're truly blessed. So he goes on here, and uh, we'll skip down to the 24th verse. So he gives each of his servants these talents, this money. And he, again, he gives one ten, he gives one five, and to a, uh, another two, and to another one. And so when the master comes back, to collect from his people, if you know the story, uh, the one that have five, he turned that into ten. 
The one that had two turned that into four and so on. But then we get to the man that had only one talent. And it says in the 24th verse, it says, Then he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, thou hast that is thine. And so when we break this down, one says he was afraid. And it says in Scripture, fear is not of God. So when there is fear in things, we have to understand that is not of God. But also he knew the expectation. He knew what the expectation was when he was given this talent. He spent more time hiding and, and trying to put this money away than if he had just did the work that God had called for him. And, and a lot of times, that's what we end up doing. When we run from God, we end up doing way more work running from God than if we would have just jumped in and said, okay, God, here's where we're going. Then, uh, skips down in the 26th verse, his Lord answered and said unto him, thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reaped where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strong. You ought, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I would have received my own usury. So he uses, the, um, he uses the excuse that I knew you were a hard man, and I knew you had these expectations, and I was worried, so I just held on to this money. And a lot of times we do that with God. A lot of times, because in this parable, this Lord, uh, that, that's representing God. And we try to say, well, oh man, I, I just... I didn't want to mess up, so I just stood still, and I just didn't move forward. And if that's his excuse, if he was truly scared of what this man would have done, he would have done something because he knew doing nothing would have ended up in him being in trouble. And the truth is, and this is true with God, the truth is he thought that his Lord was grace, so graceful and so merciful that he could do, he could do nothing and be okay. The servant, again, was wicked and slothful. So he was trying to get out of what he had been called to do. And so, <clears throat> in the 28th verse, he says, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which has ten talents. For every one that has shall be given, and he that has abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. And we have to understand this this morning. God is long-suffering, and he is gracious. However, he means what he says. And so when he says that we have a call and we, have a, we all have a ministry, he means what he says. And, and it's our job to seek it out. And again, he's long-suffering and he's gracious. And when, he, when we mess up, when we're following and we mess up, man, he's right there to pick us up and to love us. But we have to make sure that we're not standing still when he's telling us to move. And so again... That goes back to being in tune with God. It goes back to being able and listening and hearing from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in the 30th verse, he says, And cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit up on the throne of his glory. So God has blessings for us. But we have to make sure if we're standing back and standing still, if we're not careful, we fall into a backslide. If we're not careful, now not only are we not going the way that the Lord wants us to go, but we've turned and we're going the opposite way. So we have to be in that will of God. And again, saints, I, I, I want to reiterate, I want to make sure we understand, we don't have to live in fear. Oh, did God tell me to do this? And I'm just, that's just as bad as standing still. But we have to be in that relationship and that talking with God and allow Him to, to, to be in our hearts. Are you with me this morning? Am I making sense of what I'm saying? Because we have to have that. We have to understand there's a yearning, there's a desire, and God will lay that in your heart. And, and again, when you're in that will of God, uh, in the church I grew up in, we had a missionary that would come from Mexico, and he would come ever so often and he would speak. And, and he, he was in a, just this little poor village in Mexico, and he would go around and he planted churches. And man, that guy was so full of joy and so full of peace, and he would come in and, uh, you know, they, they didn't have much of anything where he was at. And he would always give the testimony of when he was a younger man, he chased after money. 
And man, he wanted the nicest cars and the best suits, and he wanted the, the best of everything. And he talked about just how miserable he was. But when he got in the will of God, here he is in a small village in Mexico, and he's, he's happier than the majority of, of Americans living in luxury and wealth. Why? Because he was in the will of God. That doesn't mean everyone's going to a, a small village in Mexico. But when you're in the will of God and you're following what God has for you, man, there's blessings in that. There's peace in that. And so in Romans chapter 12, and this is one of the verses that, and God opened this up to me and I, I just, it just jumped off the page at me. In Romans chapter 12 and, and in verse 1, he says, I beseech you, this is Paul talking to the Christians, and beseech is beg. I beg you. You know, the law commands, but grace begs and beckons us. We have a will. We have a choice whether we follow the will of God. He says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that phrase right there, reasonable service, that's what jumped off the page at me. And as I begin to study and see what those words mean, uh, there's another way that you can say it, logical requirement. So I'm going to read that with those words in there. It says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your body a living sacrifice. In other words, we sacrifice what we want and our will to say, God, what do you want? What do you have for us? Which is your logical requirement. And I want you to think about that. Our logical requirement. God has given us this great gift of salvation. God has brought us into the flock. God has forgiven our sins. He has paid our debt that we couldn't pay. It's only logical that we therefore turn around and share the gospel with someone else. And we tell our story. You know, we all have a testimony of, of where we came from and what we came through. And I believe there's times that we go through things so that we can turn around and share with people where God has brought us from. Have you ever been talking to someone and they start talking about what they're going through and you've been through that same thing and you just, the Holy Spirit just almost kind of jumps up inside of you because you, you can tell them, I was where you were. And let me tell you how I got through it. It wasn't a 12-step program. It wasn't counseling. It wasn't psychology and sociology. But what it was is I got a hold of Jesus. I met a man. I think of the woman at the well. She said, I met a man, and he told me everything I had done. And that's our commission, our, our logical requirement. We have been saved. We have been wonderfully saved. We have been brought from our sins. It is our logical requirement to take this gospel. And again, everybody has a calling. Everybody doesn't have the same calling. He goes on down in Romans, and we don't have time to get in this 12th chapter, but he says, you know, there's a hand and a foot and an eye and a mouth. You can't say if you're a hand that you're going to be a mouth. You've got to be a hand. But if you will get into what God has called you to do, what God has asked you to do, my goodness, we'll begin to see a world that's on fire for Christ. Because every day, people are dying and going to hell. Every day, people are choosing to walk away from this life. And we have a, I'm going to use that phrase again, a logical requirement to take this message to the world. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. Romans, the last verse here, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And saints, when we consecrate ourselves, when we take ourselves and we say, God, what do you have for me? I have these things, and, and, and God may, may have you go down that road. But when we stop and we yield ourselves and we say, God, what do you have for me? What is the role that you have for me? And we make that our forefront, and we make that the thing that drives every decision that we make. Saints, that is when we see souls saved. That is when we see lives changed, when we take this message of the gospel and we spread it to others. So I encourage you today. I want you to take this message as an encouragement 
that wherever you're at in your walk, begin to seek God for what He has for you. Begin to seek God for the calling on your life. God, what is it that you have for me? And you may not hear it right away, but keep seeking. Keep reading His Word. And He'll open up what He has for you and, and take you down that path. And you can be one of those saints, one of those soldiers for Christ that has taken this message and seen people saved. And we, we said it earlier, what is the, what is the fruit? What is the, what is the fruit of, of your ministry? Are you seeing life saved? Are you seeing people being brought to Christ? Are you seeing people being brought to church? And if you're here this morning, and you're here because someone invited you, and you're trying to find out about this man named Jesus and what all this is about, I leave you with this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. If you're standing with me, let me pray with you. God is good. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you so much for your word today, Father. Lord, we understand and we realize that we have a calling that you have, have laid in our lives that we are to carry out to see souls saved and lives changed. Father, I pray every person in this room would yield to you and allow your Holy Spirit to open up their eyes and see what you have called them and that they would faithfully carry out that message because we know, Father, it is our logical requirement to take the good gospel news and spread it to the world. Lord, we ask you to lead us and guide us. We thank you for everything you've done. We just thank you and we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, as we depart today, I just want to encourage everybody. Let's be like Paul. Paul said that he learned how to be a base. He learned how to be a bound. But he was content in whatever state that he was in. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.